Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and we are going to pick up where we left off from yesterday's interview with Kevin Burke and Chris Stock Wyatt, talking about Maximum Venom, talking about the cartoons they make, and then also giving a little teaser about something that's coming up in tomorrow's episode, so make sure you watch on Disney XD tomorrow night, uh, June 21st, 2020, at 9pm you know, Pacific Standard Time, or I think 9 p.m. in general, but uh, check your local listings. Make sure you don't miss out on Disney XD's Maximum Venom Episode 3 called The Vengeance of Venom, written by, the first half at least, written by J.M. DeMattis, a comic book legend, who uh, I'm so excited I might actually be able to get on the show coming up, and I'm very excited to uh, to have that for you guys. So that'll be another great interview that I'll bring to you very soon. So if you're liking these interviews, if you like the format, let me know your comments down below. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future ones. So now, without further ado, let's get to the second part of our interview with Kevin Burke and Chris Doc Wyatt. Um, so you have, you know, you have great writers joining you this season. I mean, obviously you guys are awesome and I'm a big fan, but, and you have other, you know, uh, big writers coming on, uh, both from animated world and even some that are legendary comic book writers. So what opportunities does widening the net of talented writers bring to your writer's room? Well, I mean, I can, I can, part of the reason bringing writers in and especially writers that have various backgrounds is because of what we talked about earlier, which is a lot of these stories, we're doing new versions of stories that have been told before, right, with characters we're familiar with. And if we don't find new voices or people with just different perspectives on these things, it's just going to create a feedback loop where essentially you're not creating anything new. Do you know what I mean? Essentially, you're just, you know, regurgitating what already existed. So if you grew up, say, obsessed with, obsessed with you know, a certain character and you get to write that character... Unless you're going to take that character to a place that character hasn't gone, you're really just treading water, right? And so we're always looking for writers, you know, some from come from comics, some don't even come from superheroes sometimes, just someone to bring into the room so we have different voices so it's not all the same references. You know, there's, there's a lot of writers' rooms where everyone's just referencing the same stories over and over again and then telling a new version of that same story. And we all love these characters. These characters have lasted so many decades, and we want them to last so many more decades. And the way that that happens is by refreshing them, is by having them be told by people that are taking their first shot at them, you know. Um, and so that's important to us, to have a, a, a room of diverse voices and a room of people who have different experiences. You know, some in screenwriting, some in animation, some from comics, because we want people who to approach this differently, um, because we care about these characters. We want the show to be important to kids watching this that they're gonna that, that 20 30 years from now they're gonna be want to be the ones that write this the next spider-man series whatever that is absolutely yeah i mean i think uh jim lee used to tell me like every comic is someone's first comic and uh, and so every cartoon is someone's first cartoon and that's something that as we get older we forget about and that's something i try to remind people all the time is like hey yeah this cartoon this is someone's first exposure to spider-man this is going to define them as spider-man fans for the rest of their lives and and so yeah it's great that you i mean i know that's a lot of pressure but it's great that you guys factor that in and like you said go to look for all the necessary tools to make it the best you can make it that's uh, that's outstanding it makes you guys good well, writers and good producers for sure and i can say you know one of the things about this series when we started it was it was sort of different from previous ones is we were already have spider gwen we had miles morales mm -hmm. pretty early on in the show and at the time, it, it was it was characters people weren't that super familiar with. And over the course of it, we you know we never expected the enormous success of uh, Into the Spider Verse to come along. Right. And then all of a sudden, there's a there's an absolutely new um, you know energy for these characters. Like to find out there's a series that that has all these characters in it. You know that people are now they were exposed to it on a bigger level because of the feature. Um, that's just tremendous. You know, and that's all new. You know, some of these characters we did write the first appearance of Spider Gwen and and Miles in Ultimate, but it was a different tone. It was a different show. You know, having a series with these characters now and, and people's love for these characters, yeah. it's just been it's just been tremendous, and that's exactly what we're talking about. It has refreshed the entire Spider universe for a new generation. I agree. Even even old farts like me, I mean, I, those two characters have become very quick favorites of mine and uh and that's it's the work you guys do on your show and definitely the spider-verse movie so um so yeah you're right perceptions have changed i mean someone pointed out yesterday that miles has only been around about 10 years and spider gwen maybe five or six and look at them how much they've already you know you know risen in the in the ranks you know they're like the modern day venoms in a way uh which is really great yeah, yeah they are and that's something that we don't see up as much of it as I felt like we used to say in the 90s it felt like there was a new character every week you know yeah. in comics and there have been less 
But what Miles and what Spider Gwen shows is there is a, an appetite for that. People want new characters. You know what I mean? They want to take things they know and move it into directions they're not familiar with. And that's exciting because those stories have been told four million times, right? Like right. We, we can tell some Spider Gwen stories that people aren't familiar with, and that's exciting. Yeah, Miles, I, I, Miles, when Miles first showed up, Miles was one of my favorite comic book characters. I mean, just, he was so fresh and alive, and he, he felt so much like what Peter must have felt like to readers in the 60s, like a real kid from now, you yeah. know? And uh, I even uh, uh, convinced my wife to name one of our children, his name Miles, after Miles Morales. <laughs> and when we got to write him for Ultimate Spider-Man, you know, it was just a one-off guest appearance. Um, uh, and uh, we, you know, we were so excited. We were so through the roof to be able to write his first appearance outside of comics uh but we would tell people and they'd be like miles who like what like they, it was so there was so little name recognition for him Time, yeah. and you compare that to now where you know i mean i just watched the uh, trailer for the ps5 spider-man oh, game yeah. that miles is going to be uh you know in and it's the look so amazing and um that, that character's done so well it's so exciting yeah, yeah there's nothing that- it makes us happier than seeing these characters really take off. You know, I mean, whether kids are watching the show every episode or not, like the fact that they're that they're thinking about these characters, that they're drawing these characters in their notebooks, this, that that means a lot to us. That's great. Yeah, I mean, and that you're right. That that Spider-Man game too. Like, I, I recorded a reaction video to it, and someone was like, "Dude, you're like a ten year old kid." And I'm like, "I know, man. That's how much I like Miles." Um, so there are a lot of aspiring writers. Like I mentioned earlier, there's aspiring artists that watch the show, but there's also aspiring writers that watch uh, the Venom vlog, and uh, one of them being the host of the Venom vlog show. So I guess our question is, uh, what is the writing process like on a show like this, from kind of day one to breaking the stories to completing episodes? And you know, feel free to be as brief or you know whatever as you need because I know it's that's a lot to unpack but just like a, a broad summary of like what that process is and, and how much hard work it is yeah I think we can break it down I mean into each each step doc ultimately because um, it is something that even before we got in we weren't completely familiar with how this works like when you're doing features sometimes you just you know it, there's no real process and people see a final product um, making television with executives and all these people behind it there's a very distinct set of steps that um, you have to go through so everyone gets a chance to get notes in um, so that you don't get off track, right? So you don't get derailed. Right. Um, generally, I can, I'll start and, and Doc and I can sort of trade off here, but generally Doc and I come up with synopsis sort of for the season, like whether that's an episode, 26 episode season or whether that's, in this case, you know, it's six hour long. So we come up with like these episodes will be about blank and then and X, Y, and Z has to happen in these episodes, and here's where we are in the season. So we have sort of a premise, um, and then based on those premises, we schedule a writer's room for two or three days. Okay. Um, and then the writer's room is when we call up, uh, call, you know, writers, we, it's usually Doc and I, It's we have fantastic executives in this show of, uh, we had uh, Kerry Rosenberg, who is fantastic, Marsha Griffin, who is, the vice president of, um, of animation there at the time, um, in the room with us pretty much the whole time. And we bring in various writers. Uh, we don't want to give away the names of all the writers sure. that came in the season yet, but there are some great names, some familiar names, some, um, some new names. Everyone did a fantastic job this season. And then we have a writer's room. And then Doc and I sort of trade off in the writer's room. Yeah. What we'll do is we've got the premises of what those stories that we're going to break over those uh, two or three days, and we'll sort of, um, you know, ha- just say this is the episode where this, this, this is going to happen. The, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about, you know, how we're going to do this. We'll start putting it up on the board in terms of the teaser and three acts. And you know, d- depending on the episode and a, you know where we are with our concept, and sometimes we'll start breaking the end first and then work backwards, or sometimes we have a killer teaser and we'll work forwards from that. But um, we we just start filling in pieces wherever they go inside the act structure, and then sort of solidly making it flow out so that by the end of the summit we have a set of notes on all the episodes we've broken that basically have the beats of the stories divided up into the three act structure and, and that, it's a big like it's, it's a writer's room everyone is just 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 brainstorming on it so all the voices are there everyone who's everyone who's going to be writing scripts plus us are just 
doing gags, brainstorming, trying to figure out, solve problems, all that stuff. It's a big communal situation when we do that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, and so after the writer's room, we will assign certain episodes that we broke in the room to the writers that were there in the room, and they will generate um, first what's called the beat we sheet. Actually, we actually generate the beat sheets, actually, on this, on this show, meaning that we take those notes that we wrote on the board, mm-hmm. we hammer them out. We, when we often have to come, the only thing that we got go, the thing we've got going that the other writers don't know is we know what the previous script was doing. We know what the end of the season has to do. They're not worried about that, right? So we know if some gags have already been used. We know what's working or not working. We do sort of beat sheets, get them approved by by Marvel executives and everybody, and then we send them to the to the writers. Okay. Um, at that point, they write an outline, which is typically what in our case, doc, eight or nine pages. No, eleven pages. An eleven page outline. And then uh, then Doc and I polish that, we send that up for notes, it comes back, and then um, and then we send that outline with notes to the writers, and then they've got a few weeks to write a first draft. All right. Yeah. I I, yeah, I knew it was gonna be a lot. Like <laughs> I think some people probably listening to this are going like, Wow, like uh, yeah, they, I, it, it's a lot of hard work you guys do, and it's uh, that's why I love hearing the process. So they, they do a first draft, and then does it, I'm guessing it, it gets uh, kind of more notes on it from there? Yeah, for, uh, we'll do a second draft, then we'll do a third draft, then we'll do a polish, and usually it rests at the polish and goes to production there. And sometimes at the very end, we're the ones who just end up taking the notes. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we, we don't send it back to the writer every time because sometimes the notes are just internal and they don't know the bigger picture stuff at play. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of factors that are at play sometimes, like just, again, maybe toy things or maybe a joke we just did, and it's a great joke in this episode, but we have to cut it because we already used that bit, you know? And, and so stuff like that. And then, then it goes into production, and then it goes to what Doc said. After production, when the animatics come back, we have to do pick up dialogue for animatics. If sequences aren't working or if they need some more clarity, then we do ADR. Um, for lines and a lot in Spider-Man a lot of his gags a lot of his bits are stuff that we write when we see the final animation because his mouth is rarely moving because he's got a mask on the whole time so we can always sneak a quip into a, into a fight scene or sneak some moment in with Spider-Man that you can't do with other on other shows with other actors so a lot of like the final quips that he does are often done very last after we see all the animation <laughs> nice um Sweet. And so, how long does that process take? Roughly, like a couple months from uh, from sitting in the room and bringing all the writers in, and to the to the uh, you know, I guess the animatic stage. I guess it could take up to a year, maybe, huh? Well, yeah. You don't get animatics back for a while. I mean, that'll be from from. So you're asking from the summit to when we see the first animatic, or, or the, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's well, probably okay. like a year. Well, from the summit to the first script, yeah. So the first draft is probably. Let's see, BBG, two weeks, two, uh, it were probably six weeks maybe to the first draft, okay. honestly. From Although it, it really depends because we break multiple episodes in a summit, right. uh, but then we have to do it on a schedule. So we'll we'll start, say we broke episodes five through ten in a summit, we'll start the writer on episode five, and then a few weeks later we'll start the or, writer on episode six and then and so on so depending on where you slot in in production order you might start right after the summit okay. as a freelance writer or you might start you know weeks or or more than a month later but by the time i think we hand the beat sheet off the back i think it's about six weeks to get a first draft ish okay. and then then a couple more weeks then it's probably maybe oh, 10 days for the second draft a week for the third draft and then you're in production i think it's a and then it's it's a few months for animatic Okay. At least then, after animatic shifts, it's like a year before animation comes back. Right. But really, from the time we break a story to the time it airs is anywhere from eighteen months to two years. Wow. Um, and in some ways, it's a weird way to live because, because <laughs> for instance, all the stuff we're talking to you about, we wrote two years ago, right? Right. Um, all the stuff that we're thinking, all the stuff that we're thinking about is two years in the future. Do you mean all the work that Doc and I just did today before we got on this call with you? Um, isn't going to be on TV for two more years. So we're always living this bizarre lifestyle where <laughs> we're commenting on things that are from years ago right. while working on things that are years in the future. So you're, <laughs> you're never really in the moment, right? You're, you're always, it's, it's, at first it was very difficult getting, when, you, when you're getting in and you're waiting all this time for things to happen now, we're very much used to this, 
to this flow, you know, of how things, you, 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 know, you know, you know, when you're working, you just know it's in some ways it's like planting seeds and you're waiting for the tree to grow. And that someday that tree will show show up and it'll be exciting. <laughs> yeah, you guys but are like, take a long- you're like time capsule people. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know, I know what it's like. I mean, you know, uh, previously working at Lego and stuff, like everything they do is two years in advance. So it's like, uh, all right, so we have this product coming out. Guess what you can't talk about for two years. Um, so it's like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we, can have, we can have that side conversation because we do Ninjago, and Ninjago also airs in ways that are sort of erratic sometimes in different regions. And okay. so there are times where I'm like, I don't know which episodes have aired. Do you know what I mean? Like I'll <laughs> see someone, you know, I've seen, I've seen some certain things or certain toys. I'm like, oh, that's out already. Um, I have nephews that love Ninjago, and they – they always talk about the newest episodes, and I was like, "Excuse, what? What is the newest episode?" <laughs> Just so that I'm aware of what right. you guys know, because yeah. we're already a couple years in advance. That's right, and then yeah, there's the parts of the world that already have season like twelve, but then like we're only on season like nine or ten here, you know. And it's like it kind of goes all over the place. So yeah, no, I, I know that's what that's like, and uh, it's just crazy. And so I, yeah, I'm glad you guys answered it that way because I I think that perspective of Hey, I'm interviewing these guys, and they're you guys have memories that are amazing. You're remembering these things from two years ago, while separating them from the stuff you're currently working on is that's the you're the <laughs> that's like some unsung praise you you probably don't get often. But uh, as someone who appreciates good memories, like you guys are, you, that's amazing. You guys are amazing. Um, well, thank you. Sure. Um, well, in fact, it's interesting that people don't realize how long it takes because I do recall when we were doing Avengers. We had an episode where Spider-Man showed up with the Avengers in season two, and like a month before is when Marvel got the rights to Spider-Man in film, right? Right. right. They make the big announcement, and then that episode aired, and there were people online. They were like, "Oh my gosh, they got Spider-Man back! They put him in Avengers!" And I'm like, "Guys, this we did this two, <laughs> we did this two years ago. Like, there's no way we had Spider-Man, and within a month made an episode of television and got it on TV. Do you know? Like, so." Yeah. A lot of the stuff that's happening, you know, in we just would not have known. Again, talking about Into the Spider Verse, I mean, that was in production for years. We didn't know much about it. We didn't know how it was going to relate exactly to what we were doing. Right. And uh, it all worked sort of in tandem. Do you know what I mean? It's it all it all sort of came together, and and you just don't know how the how the world's going to shift when you're in the middle of making animation. You're hoping that all of your stories will still be, you know, still be relevant. But what I can say is that you know, Doc and I have a pretty pretty decent idea of what cartoons will be like in in 2022 so we're living <laughs> in the future well, right. I'll, I'll still be watching them for sure and i'll, and I'll hopefully i'll be covering a lot of them um and there's maybe an you can wh- what's that there's an optimism to making it you know you're just kind of always looking looking down the line thinking all right 2022 this is what's going to happen so there's a there's a excitement to that yeah you're, you're per- always thinking about tomorrow yeah you're perpetually living for tomorrow which is great yeah. um and uh and so maybe, and maybe before I get to my last two questions here, you can clear something up because I have people all the time. They go because I've mentioned on the show, like, oh, I got to meet, you know, uh, Chris Doc Wyatt and, and Kevin Burke, and uh, so, and I get to meet Tom Hardy, and everyone just goes, hey, can you ask Tom Hardy uh, if he'll do this for us? And then or they'll go like, hey, can you ask Kevin and Doc if they'll uh, put this character in the show? And I'm like, guys, the shows have been <laughs> done for two years, <laughs> like, like, no, yeah, and yeah. and I don't have that power like at all, <laughs> like, yeah, I've I've seen comments from people where they'll like uh, they commented on an Avengers episode like oh, I hope they do this yeah and then three weeks later an episode airs and we did that they're like oh they took our suggestion <laughs> and it's like oh I, no. I wish I wish I could tell you that that's true but no two yeah. years ago we didn't know right. you were going to make that suggestion <laughs> well and that's the same thing too it's like you can't you know never you solicit your ideas to professionals online anyway because that you know legally we can't sure. see them or acknowledge them because it becomes that becomes problematic right but, but also because people don't understand the process there are people that will be like oh my gosh that was my idea they must have seen me post this <laughs> and, and let me tell you something like these I, there are so many there are so many people involved in these giant sort of machines of of making any television. I mean, there's hundreds of people. Right. You know, there's not a situation in which which one of us, right, come in and I'm like, Doc, you know what we're going to do? This is going to be an entire speedball episode, and then it just becomes that, right? It just doesn't. That's just not how it ever works. And uh, and so it, it is interesting to see any idea that makes it to the screen has gone through you know groups of people and has been approved by groups of people. And um, yeah, it's, there's a giant process and not just for marvel shows for for any animation right. you know i mean there's there's a there it takes a large group of people to make this happen from from the top executive level all the way down to 
you know, even just the people that that are interning on this particular job, like everyone's a part of this and everyone is, is engaged in this. And uh, and it's a it's a big machine. So it is interesting to see how quickly some of those people think we can pivot, you know, on shows or on stuff because you it doesn't work like that. Absolutely. Um, well, if you ever want to make a whole episode about Big Wheel, I'll be I'll be on. I'll be I'll definitely <laughs> tune into that one. Um, I believe Big Wheel mentioned in season one. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. I think so. Yeah. I remember because I because yeah. I'm a big Prowler and Big Wheel are like these two characters I've always pushed for and stuff. And uh, I yeah, anytime I hear their names, I'm like, yay! Like uh, so. oh, then, you know, yeah, you know it's in season it's in season two. Uh, Superior took down Big Wheel, if I recall. Yeah. Um, correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so I have there my. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. You got. You got it in there. See. It, and see, that was my idea. You guys. It stole it yeah, th- four years ago. <laughs> uh, we went back in time and, and made that happen. Yeah. Um, so with uh, with my last two questions, we have two episodes that have aired already of Sp- Marvel Spider Man Maximum Venom, um, and you've revealed the uh, incoming threat, obviously, of the army of symbiotes. And the one thing I really liked that was done in in the second hour was the Peter's growth, and and maybe even on his way to a leadership role, which I think very much suits Peter Parker and. I'm kind of curious, since that's one of my favorite moments and arcs I've seen so far, in the first two episodes, if you guys can remember specifically, um, in those episodes, uh, what are some of your favorite moments or arcs that happened uh, so far? Um, Well, it's a delight to bring MJ into the show. Um, It's something we've we've had on our list for a long time, and Felicia Day uh, bringing the character to life has been just so wonderful. Um, we we got to work with her on a previous show, and she was our first really choice for MJ. And uh, the way that MJ interacts with Peter, and the different aspects that she sort of brings to his life, um, you know, she's different than all of his Horizon friends, and she challenges him in ways that. Um, he doesn't get challenged by his horizon friends and so i'm excited about mj and what she means for peter awesome yeah i'd I'd say i i the two things that strike me the first two two episodes is i love the end of the first episode where where venom is sending that signal up into space and when that signal goes through space and awakens the symbiotes we we pitched that in the room you know about how we wanted to end the first episode on this and everyone was just like oh man that is tremendous right this idea that they're all going to look up and we know you know it's about to get crazy uh, and to Doc's point yeah MJ is fantastic and the thing that I love about that second episode tied to MJ is just that that's a Peter Parker episode that's the difference between him and the Avengers is that he's got to balance trying to deal with a girl he's got a crush on while hanging out with his friend while trying to try, trying to decipher an alien language from a cassette tape right, <laughs> right. like that 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 relatability, that like, that if you're a kid and you watch this and you're like, this would probably be me, me if I had special powers. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be Iron Man. I would be that kid who's shy around somebody and then and has to run out of the room and can't explain it to my mom. Mm-hmm. That that really is a Spider-Man Peter Parker moment and sequence, and it really is what makes the character sort of been lovable, so lovable all these decades. I man, I couldn't agree more, and that's definitely why I've, I've loved Spider-Man for so many years. Even now, as a older person, I like reading some of the alternate universe stories where he's married and has kids, and it's like, wow, I, I still to this day relate to Peter Parker, man. He's he's uh, he transcends, uh, he's timeless, you know. Um, yeah. With the uh, the final question I have here is with the third episode airing this weekend, uh, which will you know when this episode when our recording airs, what are you two the most excited about to see fans react to? Now I know you can't talk about, and I don't want any spoilers for the episodes, but anything that's maybe out there already, is there anything that you're just happy to kind of see fans react to? Well, it, it's in it's in all the trailers and it's in the. Uh, the episode descriptions so folks know that Moon Knight is going to be a guest star and we are really excited we've got uh, J.M. DeMattis the classic um, comic book writer uh, 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 doing that episode and still you know he he's, does such great work um, t- to just up till now we've been fans of his since we were kids and we're fans of him now <laughs> and to, to sort of pair him with Moon Knight on our show it's something we just were so excited about going into the season yeah and, and I, without giving any spoilers this this is a big episode 
that's coming. This is the episode that the production was like, oh gosh, guys, there's a lot going on here. So that's all I'll say about that is that this is we've been building up to something, and this is a, this is a big, big episode. Awesome. Well, I and I am one, uh, one. I'm a huge fan of Mark Spector and Moon Knight and J.M. DeMattis. And so seeing his name and uh, seeing the character Moon Knight coming in and hearing it's big, it's it, it means a lot. I, I'm so glad that you two, of, of all people who clearly have a passion for this and have a talent for it, I'm so glad you guys are the ones who have kind of been pioneering in this show and bringing it in these new directions and being very smart in who you hire to come in and write with you guys. Like, in my opinion you've done an amazing job and I'm so grateful to have you guys here and take time out of your day to have this you know long one hour interview with me so I can share this with people who watch the show I hope they enjoy it as much as I did because your time meant everything to me and and uh, I, I feel like I learned a lot today and I, I can't thank you enough for being here thank you so much for having us man thank you we're big fans of what you're doing and your show so we are absolutely excited to be here this has been great thank you for having us sure and like I said uh, you guys uh, it's a Kevin Burke 20 right on social media and uh, and there's Otherland 90 71. 71. Otherland 71. Otherland 71. So those links, guys, are down below in the description box. Uh, so uh, just go down there, click on those, follow these guys so you can check out their amazing work on this show, their amazing work on other shows they work on, and so you can say you've been fans of theirs for two years when their shows two years from now air, and you can be like, oh, I've known those guys forever. <laughs> uh, thank you guys again, and uh, hopefully we can have you again uh, uh, on sometime in the future. We'd love that. Yeah, we'd love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. And everyone watching, thanks so much for watching the show. So don't forget to subscribe, like, and all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.